And I know you have it backwards. You're looking back here somewhere looking for the least. And you're looking up here to see the most. But that's the point. You've got it backwards. Those who we are strive to be the most should be the least. And they should serve and not desire to be served. A friend of mine called me this week and he had good news for me. He said, Bishop. Bentley that you could buy with only 20,000 miles on it is a Bentley with mahogany wood trim, is a Bentley with Corinthian leather. It is a Bentley wherein the back seat there's silver trays and cups that come out. It is a Bentley that when it drives down the street, surely, Bishop, every head would turn. And, and Bishop, you need to have this car because all the other bishops have one. Bishop, you need to be like the bishop on Greenleaf. You need to have a life and have it more abundantly. And you know, it's easy to want things. It's easy to desire a life of comfort. It's easy to say, give all that is special to me. But that's not following Jesus. You know, so many have tried to take Jesus and make him a wealthy man. So many have tried to take Jesus and, and make him a favorite man. So many wanted Jesus to be an example of a political leader. But such was not the case. Jesus held no position. He had no wealth. Jesus only sought to serve. As we begin to assess where our lives are, we have to admit who is sovereign in our life, who holds sway over everything, who gives direction, meaning, and purpose to our existence. Well, we say as followers of Jesus, he does. But that can't be true. Because politically, we cannot call ourselves followers of Jesus and stand at the border between Mexico and the United States and deny access to this country to anyone. Because as a follower of Jesus, we are servants to the poor. As followers of Jesus, in Matthew 25, the whole chapter is in red. And Jesus clearly says that when he was a stranger, did you take me in? When he was an alien, did he said, Lord, when did we see you at the border under Mexico and the U.S. and did not take you in? You know, you want to be a follower of Jesus and a member of the NRA. How can such a thing be? You want God to be sovereign in your life. But you want to have a weapon where you can lord over others and take their life at will. You can't be both. You can't have Jesus and a membership in the NRA. You can't hold up guns that empower you to be over others. That is not the way of Jesus. You, you want to be a follower of Jesus? You want to proclaim his word? Well, you cannot deny someone food Amen. when he knocks at the door. So when did I see you hungry, Lord, and refuse to feed you? Whether you sit in the Congress of the United States, whether you sit on the board of a nonprofit, when you deny hungry, the hungry, food, you're denying Jesus. You know, this notion of being able to sit on the right hand of Jesus when he is in glory. Say, so Lord, in your glory, I want to sit on your right hand. 
and we have to examine our lives, who is sovereign in our lives? Do, do we hold our membership card in a political party to be our sovereignty, or do we hold our seat in the glory of Jesus Christ as sovereign in our lives? You see, how we view God determines how we're going to view everything else. God is calling us to follow his son, Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting that we find nowhere in the scriptures where Jesus spent his time accumulating wealth? We're not finding Jesus in the stock market of our day. We're not finding Jesus on the employment roll. We're not finding Jesus seeking to be a lender or a borrower. We find Jesus proclaiming the word of God. We find the followers of Jesus forsaking everything. Their fishing business, their tax collecting jobs, their physician responsibilities, their fishing expedition. They are forsaking everything for the sake of the gospel and the salvation of man. My brothers and sisters, this notion of prosperity has so deeply entrenched itself into the minds of the American psyche that we have no answer for the sick, for the maimed, for the poor, for the destitute. We have no answer for those who are broken. Oh, we parcel out little crumbs and, and we make requirements for them to eat. We said, oh, you can't eat the food that our government provides unless you work a certain number of hours. How can we be followers of Jesus and have partiality at every step of the way in all of our lives? Jesus asked them, do you want the right to sit next to me on my right in glory? Can you drink from the cup that I drank? Can you suffer the persecution? Can you give everything that you have, give it away to the poor? When the young rich ruler came to him, I don't know whether he was Republican or Democrat. I don't know whether he was a man uh, of high status and estate, but he was rich and he came to Jesus. And he said, what must I do to be saved? He said, well, keep the law, the commandments. He said, I've done that since I was a child. Then give all that you have away to the poor. Now, as a country, we cannot claim to be followers of Jesus. When we have amassed and accumulated the wealth of centuries, and now, as we see the poor around the world are growing, we are giving less. Less. We want to cut off countries. We want to deny them the freedom that we have, the liberty that we have in Christ. You can take our money, but you must bow down to our flag. You must bow down to our leaders. You must bow down and submit your will until our desire to be a follower of Jesus. Are we prepared to open our hearts to the sovereignty of God? Where we see the purpose of living is to manifest the will of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. My brothers and sisters, if you spend all of your time trying to figure out a way from poverty to wealth, then you missed the point. You missed it. If you spend all your time trying to network with somebody, if you're spending all your time in line trying to buy a lottery ticket for the billion-dollar lottery, you missed the whole point. A Christian is a peculiar person. He's not taught by cultural, he's not taught by political or economic bounds. He's not tied up in the things of the world today. He is preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. You know, some of you will say to me, 
well, I have a choice to be rich or poor. Why should I choose being poor? That's not the question. It's not the question of why should you choose to be poor or rich. The question is, how shall you choose to serve God? You know, so many great men of God. I often hold the scriptures to their lives as I hold it to mine. There was one of the great oracles of our time who preached the gospel of Jesus Christ worldwide. And when he died, he had an estate that covered miles. He had over 25 million in his personal bank account. He had a name that had risen above the name of Jesus, among the followers of Jesus. They said the name of Jesus didn't resonate unless he said it. Unless he preached it. Now, they held him in high esteem. They commemorated him in every way that you could imagine. And as I look around the world and say that the poor do not have all of his wealth. As I look around at all the strangers standing at the borders asking to come in, they don't have an entrance fee given by him. As I look around at all the hungry, it would seem that they collect money from all the rest of us to give to the poor in shoe boxes. But they give absolutely nothing of their own wealth. Somebody ought to say amen. Is this an indictment? Yes. Is it an indictment of that preacher and his family? No, it's an indictment of us. Because each one of us stand in the same way that he stood. We are preaching the gospel, twisting it where it comes out that we gain and everybody else loses. We are preaching the gospel of saying that we ought to be on the right hand of God, in the favor of God, that we ought to have the blessings of God, that we ought to have the abundance of God. And at what expense the rest of the world shall suffer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, so many times I'm hearing people talking about the favor of God. I want the favor of God. If there's anyone that would have the favor of God, it would be his son. His son, Jesus. Let's examine the favor that he had from his father on high. He was born not in a hospital. He was born not in a Holiday Inn, not in a red car. He was born in a manger, in a stable filled with filthy animals. That's the favor of God. He came in a low position. And when he rose up to be a great preacher, all he had to do was take up a collection of the 5,000 instead. He fed them at no charge. Somebody ought to say amen. You want the favor of God? He walked and had to avoid persecution, had to avoid the people, the leaders of his church who tried to murder him. And finally, the favor of God, the mission and intent of his life was found on a cross, a Roman cross put up by Jewish people. A Roman cross constructed out of the the ill will of Jewish leaders. He came with the favor and grace of God to have an abundant life. And what was that abundance? The abundance was to offer salvation by his blood for every man, woman, and child. And so, well, not only did he have not a place to live, but he didn't have a tomb to be buried. Jesus stands in the midst of a historical context of poverty and favor of God. He stands there as an iconic figure in the midst of the wealth of the Roman Empire. And because he lived and because he preached, the very underpinnings of the Roman Empire crumbled and fell at his death on the cross. Why? For whom? 
Was it for the rich Roman emperors? Was it for all the Pharisees and Sadducees? Was it for all the leaders of Israel? No. It was for each one of us, rich and poor. When you examine the sovereignty of God, prosperity is just a city in South Carolina. It is not a destination for our lives. But what does he require? Yes, we should be involved in enterprise. We should be involved in creating. We should be involved in building. And to us for that work, we will accumulate some wealth. But I'm looking at the other scripture of this morning, and we have seen Job. Nowhere do we see Job begging that the favor of God would return his riches. Nowhere do we see Job asking God to bless him over and over with things. We are seeing Job saying, Lord, I love you. Open up your heart and love me. Job is crying out for God to remove any barrier that stands between him and God. But so many of us are blinded by the material things of the day. And so what has church become? Church, as we know it, has become one of the largest entertainment venues in all of man's history. Church has become a place where you can get your praise on and get your shout off. Church has become a place where you can have social and economic status because of your association with the things of God. Church has become a place of absolute sacrilege. Nothing left in it is holy. The very nature and the mercy of God dwells within but the people have turned to having itching ears, only wanting to hear what they want to hear. They're only interested in having a seat in the high box, the special seats, the paid seats. It's all based on how much. I was told a story this week about a great healing evangelist. And he would go all over the country. and People in wheelchairs would come up and they would come and he would lay on his hands. And through the power of God that was in his hands, they would be healed. A little girl in a small rural town heard of this great man. And she had a sister that was severely handicapped, severely uh, 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 denied the physical attributes of strength and health. She was crumpled up and her body was wrecked with all kinds of disease and illness. And the little girl said to her father, if we can get her to this man and he could lay his hands on her, by the power of God, she could be healed. She said, I've read the miracles that God has done in the Bible. I know that this man can heal. And the father reluctantly said, well, I don't think any of this is true. She said, but oh, we have a hope and we have a chance that she could be whole. So the father reluctantly took her. And there were wheelchairs all lined up. And when the man uh, saw her, the handler saw her and her condition, they pointed her to a room on the side. When he got up there to talk to the handlers, they said, what is it worth to you for this young lady to be healed? He said, what do you mean? He said, how much would you pay for this young lady to be healed? And since a righteous dignation just came over the man, that they would be there offering to sell that was Jesus died for on the cross and is available to all of us. That the men who represent God himself have taken that and turned it into a carnal return of wealth in the natural. That man grabbed his little daughter 
and said, if this is the price we pay to a God we serve, I want no part of it. Prosperity has turned so many heads. My wife and I were in a new Chinese restaurant last night, and my God, it was maybe three or 400 people there. And we saw some of our African-American friends who were there, oh, they were in there, packed. And we looked at the expensive price of what it costs to eat. And we thought back years ago when we were taking our young people to these kinds of restaurants and say, eat, for well, this is the abundance of God. And we thought to say, how many there are willing to give up their meal, give up their wealth, give up their position to be a follower of Christ? The sovereignty of God. As we look around, we notice that in our church, there's a move to make the mission of God the personal comfort of every individual. I want you to know that that is not of heaven. That is not of heaven. If you make heaven on earth, if you refuse to acknowledge the eternal presence of God in the world, then you also deny the eternal presence of hell. If you cannot acknowledge the afterlife and Jesus Christ, then also you cannot acknowledge the afterlife and Lucifer, Satan himself. And we put our earthly realm on the level of heaven itself. And if we could consume everything carnal right now and call it heaven, then the words of Jesus in Matthew 25 become clear. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it to a, one of the least of these brethren, you have done it unto me. Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty all over Africa, all over Asia. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was in Puerto Rico, and the storm came, and you turned your back on me. I was a stranger on the borders of Mexico, and you would not let me in. I was a stranger in foreign lands of Haiti. I was a stranger in El Salvador. And I was a stranger, and I came to the house, to the country of God of Jesus, and let me in, and you would not let me in. I was sick, and you said, no health care for you. It's much too expensive. No doctor visit for you. No medicine for you. I was sick and you would not treat me. And I was in prison and you demanded when I got out that I had to announce to everyone I was a prisoner and I could not get a job. You put a box there to box me in. Oh, if we're followers of Jesus, if we're followers of Jesus, it is for us to turn this world upside down. And we have a different proposition. We live because he died. We live to serve and not be served. We live to give and not suck up everything for ourselves. He said, I was naked, sick, in prison, and you did not minister to me. I want you to know the meaning of church has changed. And then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, 
Inasmuch as you did it until one of the least of dead, you did it not to me. And these things shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. So the question is, what are you living your life for? How much you can eat, how much you can drink, how much you can make yourself sovereign over all things, how many weapons you can have, how many people you can deny, how many sick you can deny health care, how many single parents, how many Me Too raped, assaulted, how many you can deny, or will you live your life as Jesus? When the woman came who was accused of adultery, it wasn't Jesus who criticized. It wasn't Jesus who condemned. It was Jesus who said, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. Are you casting stones today? Well, my brothers and sisters, I think it's time for us to re-examine what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, where we give more than we take, where we serve more than we are served, where we lift others up, where we open that door and let others in. This is the cause of Jesus. Let us stand. <laughs> ¶¶